So folks, we're talking about wage gaps, and we know that there's been a lot of discussion about wage gaps for folks in the LGBT community. We even referenced the Prudential 2018 and 2012 LGBT financial experience surveys, and that highlighted uh, the uh, sexual orientation and gender identity pay gap. Yeah, but recent studies have suggested that gay men and lesbian women who are coupled are now closing that gap, uh, and that's piqued our interest. And so we dug into the data because we're like, is this true? Can this possibly be? <laughs> is how great would that story? How great would that be? But right. yeah, it turns out it's not actually the whole story when you dive deeper into the data and figure out exactly what's going on be behind those headlines. Right. It, especially when we overlaid uh, data that came out from HRC that shows that LGBT folks across races, with the exception of Asian and Pacific Islanders, all other races are earning less than their non-LGBTQ counterparts. So we're all earning less. So how is it that as couples, we're earning more? Well, um, one of the data points that came out of the U.S. Census is kind of, I think, really kind of the the bedrock of uh, of this, maybe the, this, this discussion. And that is that even when children are involved, both partners in same-sex relationships are 27% more likely to be both working than their opposite sex counterparts. So we're working our asses off when it right. comes to being in, a, in couples compared to our... More of us in the household are working more and working longer. And so this is a dynamic that's not as prevalent with straight couples, uh, where usually one partner uh, and usually the heterosexual woman um, stays home with the kids. Or even if you dive deeper into the data, uh, very often uh, one person is just staying home, whether they whether kids are prevalent or not. And that's not necessarily a dynamic that's available to uh, LGBTQ couples or same-sex couples. Yeah, unless you get a sugar daddy or a sugar mama. <laughs> <laughs> and allegedly, that's all we're all looking for. That's our retirement plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the other interesting points here is that uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit, is that the data kind of points to the fact that even when kids are involved, um, lesbian women are working more hours than their straight counterparts. So it's not just the fact that both people are working. It's when maybe one isn't working full time, they are still working more hours. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about the lesbian advantage that suggests that lesbians earn 9% more than their heterosexual counterparts with the same qualifications. Um, and MV Lee Badgett on Queer Money episode 323 sort of debunked that lesbian advantage. Um, and when you dive deeper into the data, you can see why she debunked that. And um, and the if there if there is a gay advantage, there's there's the uh, theory, then that's debunked as well. Cause we're just, uh, you can see that when you dive into the data, we're just, we're, all of us are working a lot more. Yeah. Evidently 9% more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So while we may be closing the sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, gender identity pay gap, it's more likely because more queer people are working more on average than our straight counterparts. Yeah. And remember last week, uh, on the bonus episode, we talked about how queer folks, it's important for us to start talking about our salaries, salary transparency. This is another really strong reason as to why we want to do this, because it really does then highlight not only for those of us within the community where our salaries are at, but it really does compare our, us to our heterosexual counterparts. Yeah. And it's, it's also important not just to know the headline data, but it's also important for us as LGBTQ folks to understand the, the data behind the data so that when, you know, your conservative Republican family member comes out and says, oh my gosh, you guys are getting paid more than the rest of us. And so you, you've achieved equality, you've surpassed it. I'm now inferior. Um, you know, you, you, you can, you can contradict that with a little bit more data that says, actually, it's not as cozy as it might seem because we're all working more than you are lazy straight <laughs> people. <laughs> right. All right. So of course we have a queer money takeaway for you for this show. Uh, join us in just a second for that. Stick around. Hey, folks, thanks again for listening to another episode. Here's your Queer Money Takeaway. Um, as we've said before, we encourage you, especially we did this on episode 323, get and read M. V. Lee Badgett's book, The Economic Case for LGBTQ Equality, as well as dig into this U.S. Census data on LGBTQ incomes. This is a really important topic for us to understand so that we can better advocate not only for ourselves, but for folks in the community. And as John pointed out earlier, maybe to fend off some of our naysayers.
Exactly. Make Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner more interesting. <laughs> then join us next Tuesday when we host George Perlov of Open for Business and we talk about the most inclusive LGBTQ friendly cities around the world. And next Thursday for another bonus episode when we talk about how LGBTQ folks are or are not investing. Are you investing? You'll find out. Have a great weekend. 